Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I want to start off by thanking Mr. Loinga for coming out here from West Michigan to deliver this, this speech for us and also for the outreach committee, um, who's Mark Van Vorthuizen, Grant Bohr, Wayne Buter, and Charles Potcher. They do the majority of the work to organize this and, and make it happen. So thank you for all your, your hard work. And thanks for asking me to come up here and do this, too. I appreciate that. Um, I want to ask everybody to hang around after the lecture, because we will have stuff going on in the back, free literature, a bookstore, some food and drink. So just like any other lecture we host here, we'll be, we'll be doing that. I also want to invite any of our visitors who are not members of this congregation to join us in worship this coming Lord's Day. We worship here in this sanctuary at uh, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning and 5 p.m. And we'd love to have you here. And we thank you for coming here tonight, too, because what Mr. Loinga is going to be talking about tonight has to do with the Protestant Reformation, which occurred or started in 1517. And it's a very important event in the history of the world, one of the most important events. And unfortunately, in Christendom today, Halloween takes precedent over this very important event. And our church has a, a tradition of holding a lecture around the time of the uh, October 31st date where we talk about the Reformation and Martin Luther and all that good stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I ask all of you to open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that's in the New Testament. That's right before 2 Corinthians. We're going to start reading at verse 17, and we'll read through the, the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul uses the words wisdom in this uses the word wisdom in this text, and we got to remember wisdom is a good thing, but when we're talking about the wisdom of the world, which is an antithetical statement to the Christian truth, it's not a good thing. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, for the preaching of the cross is them to perish, that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both, Jew, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. For, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's have a brief prayer before I introduce our speaker. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we come in prayer and we ask thee to hear us not on, in, on our account because we are so special, but because 
Jesus Christ is special. We remember Jesus Christ to be the fairest and the chiefest of 10,000. He is our king. He is our captain. He is our savior. Lord, we come unto thee in his name and his name only. We thank thee tonight for the opportunity to gather together in this building to hopefully learn a thing or two and to grow as Christians and to learn truth. We thank thee for men like Martin Luther and the work that thou hast accomplished through what he did, such a seemingly innocent thing, nailing a piece of paper to a door, but yet it caused a firestorm, and most importantly, it fixed theology, which was in need of major fixing. So we give thee thanks for the Protestant Reformation. We give thee thanks for Martin Luther. And Lord, we pray that Christendom, Christians around the world, would get back to proper thinking about the gospel, about Jesus Christ, about antithetical living. For unfortunately, and we have to be careful because we look at ourselves first and we understand that we are not perfect. We understand that we have sin. But unfortunately, we see so much falling away today. Not just in doctrine, although that's a big thing, but also in living. And so, Lord, would thou cause thy kingdom to come quickly, gather thy people, and help us as Christians, and Christians wherever they, get, they are found, to get back to thinking biblically. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brendan Loinga. Well, actually, before I get to him, um, question and answers. We all kind of know the drill. For those of you who aren't members here, there should be three by five cards in the pew in front of you, pencils. If you have any questions for Mr. Loinga, write them down during the lecture, and after he's done, we'll collect those give them to Mr. Loinga and he'll try to answer them, all right? If you are younger than five years old, you may draw pictures on them, okay? Ruth wanted to do that. Our speaker this evening is Brendan Loinga from the Grand Rapids area in Michigan. He is a graduate from Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and an alumni of the University of Michigan, where he earned his PhD in cellular and molecular biology. His current profession is a research and development scientist at a biotechnology company in Grand Rapids. Brendan is the editor of The Beacon Lights, a magazine particularly for reformed Christian young people and young adults. He is also a member of the Theological School Committee for the Protestant Reform Seminary, he has served as a ruling elder at Zion Protestant Reformed Church in Jenison, Michigan. Brendan is married to Kelly, and they have five daughters. So let's uh, have Brendan come up here and take it away. All right. Looks like the microphone's working. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. It's uh, always a pleasure to visit with the congregation. And, and since one of those five daughters you heard about has uh, moved out here, we've had more opportunities. So it's wonderful to be here with you all and to get to know all of you even, uh, even more than we already do. Um, a little bit about the, the advertising for this. So you probably all saw the flyers, and I, uh, I led Charles astray, and uh, he put up flyers for a, a speech, and then I changed the title on him, of course. But in any case, uh, when we had spoken uh, a few months back, we had talked about a few options, and I had given a lecture previously at our Randolph congregation in Wisconsin about cultural conformity, fleeing cultural conformity that was based especially on Romans chapter 12. And uh, he had invited me to, to give that speech again, and then I thought, well, if you're going to fly me all the way out here, I should probably put to something uh, new together instead. So I went back to the drawing board and pulled out a few of those ideas, but I wanted to take advantage of the fact that we're right around Reformation Day right now, so it's a good opportunity to talk a little bit about the history of Reformation Day and to put that together. And what I really wanted to talk about is something that probably isn't what you've heard about when you've heard about Martin Luther 
and about the 95 Theses. And I actually want to talk about something completely different that's relevant to his history and talk a little bit about the theology of the cross. And that's why I entitled the lecture Children of the Cross. And there's some overlap with that prior lecture. And if you want to hear that, I think, I think uh, Randolph has that on their webpage. But this is something new and different. So I want to start out with a similar premise, though. And that's this question of what is going on in history? So the church, since Christ ascended into heaven, has gone through a line that we typically think of as sort of linear, starting around the year zero and going to the year 2023 where we're at today. But what I really want to emphasize is that we're kind of coming back to where the church started when Christ went to heaven. And as you know, that early church was persecuted. In the first couple of centuries of the church after Christ ascended into heaven, the experience of believers was persecution. And it wasn't until several hundred years later when Constantine, the Roman emperor, introduced Christianity as the religion of the empire that it became embraced as a religion in Europe. And over the subsequent centuries after that, actually became more than just embraced, it became the religion. And you're aware enough, I'm sure, of the Middle Ages when in Europe pretty much Christianity was the only religion. It was the privileged religion. And that's been our experience for over 1,500 years since then. But now we're starting to see something different. And we've all noticed that and realized that in the world that we live in, that Christianity is less and less privileged and now is criticized. And what we see is that circle coming all the way back around where now Christianity is abandoned and scorned and moving more and more to be hated. And we expect, based on what we know from Scripture, that once again we're going to be back at persecution again. So the question that I want to ask tonight and get to, using Martin Luther and his theology as a basis for this, is how do we respond? How are we going to respond to this? Are we going to be theologians, Christians of glory or of the cross? And really what this is is a question of how do we understand history and how do we understand and, and know what to expect based on what the Lord has told us. And throughout this history of the last 2,000 years, what's happened again and again is that the church gets off track into a theology of glory. And I'll explain that tonight. This is Martin Luther's idea. And what he said is, no, it's not a theology of glory that we should be pursuing. It's the theology of the cross. And what I'd encourage you all to see tonight through what we're going to talk about is that the theology of the cross is a perspective that we ourselves can very easily get sidetracked from as well. But that's the perspective that we need to have if we're going to understand and live in the society that no longer is privileging Christianity, but is moving closer and closer to persecuting Christianity. And we'll talk about what a right response is for believers today. Before I get into the, the speech itself, I wanted to note a couple of things. I'm not a historian, I'm not a theologian, and I'm not a pastor. So that puts me at a big disadvantage for this type of stuff. So I have to have some resources. So I just want to note a couple of really helpful resources and actually encourage some reading for those of you who may not have read these before. Eric Metaxas is actually a, a, a secular historian. Um, he has a Christian perspective, but he's really a secular historian. He wrote a marvelous uh, biography of Martin Luther, and if you have not read it before, very strongly encourage that. And I had read it in the past, but went through it again to, to pull out several details that are pertinent tonight. Uh, also, another man who is also a historian and a wonderful church historian, Carl Truman, he's an Orthodox Presbyterian professor of church history at uh, Grove City College out in Pennsylvania. He's written several books, including uh, a short biography of Luther and, and some more recent things that are really helpful, I think, in understanding the world that we live in today. So again, if you haven't read Carl Truman, wonderful church historian to follow. And last but not least, uh, a friend of mine, Marco Barone, who actually is an employee at the RFPA, the Reform Free Publishing Association in West Michigan. And his background is actually as a philosopher, so he earned his uh, doctorate in philosophy in Italy, so he's a native of Italy, and he wrote a wonderful book called Luther's Augustinian Theology of the Cross. And that was really helpful for me to understand what we're going to talk about, which is about the Heidelberg Disputation, because if you read through it, and again, I'd encourage you to do so, it's not the easiest reading that you'll ever do, and there's reasons for that, but Marco does a wonderful job of breaking that down and getting to the core of Luther's theology and purpose, which is to show Luther wasn't starting from scratch. These weren't new ideas. 
But this was Augustinian theology from the very early church. And it's a reformation that's a rediscovery of correct theology. And again, wonderful book that you can get online. I believe he sells it through Amazon. So another great resource to help understand. So those are the main things that I I, uh, relied on. So let's get into the speech itself. Tonight, Children of the Cross, I want to talk about four things. And that's how you know it's not a sermon, because there's four points. And ministers only get three, so this is four points. But I promise not to be as long as Pastor Cordes on those points. So in any case, we're going to set up the context a little bit. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the context of Luther in medieval Europe. Because the education system and everything about Luther's context is so different than the world we live in today, it's useful to go back and understand where he was coming from. And we also want to point to God's handiwork in this, and that's especially that second point, is understanding how the Lord laid out very specific influences in Martin Luther's life that made him able to make the observations that he did and to lead the church back to proper theology. Then we'll get into what he actually talked about in something called the Heidelberg Disputation. And then finally, really the core of this is coming back to where I started, which is how can we use this? How can we use this aspect of church history to help us respond to the world that we live in today? All right, so from the beginning, Luther's late medieval context was 15th century Europe. And for those of you students who are studying this, this would be the 1400s A.D., All right, so a little over 500 years ago, Martin Luther was a monk. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what the world was like for him because it's very different than the education system that you're in today. So the first thing that's incredibly different about it is the fact that Martin Luther is a monk. And I'm pretty sure nobody in this room is a monk. And if you are, raise your hand. Okay, no monks in here. I didn't expect that there would be. But monks are not something that's a common part of Christianity for us today. There are some who are Roman Catholics, but again, even there, this isn't as common. And the particular monastic order or the group of monks that he belonged to was a group of monks called the Augustinians. And these were monks who were organized under what's called the rule of St. Augustine. And if you know Augustine, he was a very important early church theologian, but he also lived life more or less as a monk after he converted to Christianity. He was also the bishop or the main preacher in a a city called Hippo, which was in Africa. So Augustine, at this time, he would not set up a monastery. This was not until several thousand years later, actually about 1,200 years later. But what he had written was a rule of life for members who were living in a Christian community of how do we treat each other with love? And how do we live as brothers in Christ together? And he had written in his book, Confessions, With arrows of your charity, you had pierced our hearts, and we bore your words within us like a sword penetrating us to the core. And that emblem, which was the medieval emblem of the Augustinian order, that's not an apple, it's actually a flaming heart, that's what it was intended to display, with that arrow piercing it, referring to this specific passage. Now, it actually wasn't until several thousand or a hundred years later, in 1244, that a group of monks who lived in northern Italy organized as a religious order of monks. And these were men who were living separately, they weren't married, and they were living a religious contemplative life apart from society. That's what monks were. And they organized and said, we want to live according to this rule of St. Augustine. That's how we're going to organize our society. So they went to the Pope and asked to be organized, and they were organized in 1244. Now, about 30 years later, one of the councils of the church, the Council of Lyon in France, said, well, this is a useful group of men and their ideas are spreading all over Europe. They're now in Germany and they're in France. Maybe we can take advantage of the spread of this and use them as preachers. So within the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, you may have heard of men called friars and they were men who lived lives of poverty and they traveled without really anything that they owned from one town to another preaching and caring for the poor and teaching. And these were known as the mendicant orders of the church. So perhaps you've heard of the Benedictines or the Dominicans or the Franciscans. Those are all different religious orders that were mendicants. They traveled around, they lived in poverty, and they taught the people of Europe who didn't necessarily have a priest within their area that could teach or baptize or care for them. Now, one of the things that's especially notable about the Augustinians 
is that their emphasis, because of their appreciation for Augustine, was always on education. And interestingly, they were most interested in science and theology. And I was actually laughing about this with Pastor Chorus this afternoon. I said, if you were going to be a monk, you would have been an Augustinian. There's no question about it. Science and theology, these are your two things, Pastor Cordes. So he agreed. So he would have been an Augustinian if he lived in these days. And especially what they were interested in was actually higher education. So during this time, right about the time of the organization of the Augustinians, universities were starting to become organized by the church all over Europe. And within these universities, they weren't secular schools, they were associated with the church. And the people who taught in those universities were usually priests or some other official within the Roman Catholic Church. And some of these positions were actually dedicated to the Augustinians. So there would be endowed chairs, positions in universities, that were always held by an Augustinian uh, priest or monk who would do the teaching there. And the reason why this is relevant is because that's exactly the type of position that Martin Luther had. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Now there's a couple things that we, could show, we should say about uh, medieval education. Again, it was very different than what we have today, but there are some things that we should know because there had been a big change that was going on right about the same time that the Augustinians were organized. And this was known as the 12th century Renaissance. So for some of you children who probably study a little bit of church history, right around the, world, or right around the year 1000, a big change in the world was the fact that a lot of warriors were going from Europe to try and recapture Jerusalem and to create a Christian area around Jerusalem so that pilgrims could go there and be safe. And those were known as the Crusades. And that crusading took a really long journey. Some of those soldiers got on ships and sailed across the Mediterranean. Others went up through Turkey and down through Syria into Palestine. But whatever route they took, they ended up having to go through new areas that Europe hadn't been exposed to very much before, places like Constantinople or Istanbul. And in Constantinople, there was a Greek Orthodox church, and they had a lot of manuscripts and books that had been completely lost to Europe. So what the 12th century Renaissance was, was a rediscovery. These men came back from the Holy Land and said, look at all this stuff that we found. These are things that we haven't seen before. We know about Rome, and we know about Greece, but we have not read anything by these people for a long time. And they brought copies of manuscripts with them, and the people in the university started reading them and saying, oh, hey, This is interesting. Now, what they were studying, unfortunately, was not the manuscripts of the Bible, which were written in Greek or written in Hebrew, but what they were mostly studying were the uh, the writings of men like Aristotle, and that's the picture I have there. Aristotle was a famous philosopher who actually lived before Christ. And he had written a lot of philosophical ideas down, and these men would read these and say, this is really fascinating, I think this fits with Christianity. And what they started doing was developing a whole system of theology through the Middle Ages that relied on Greek philosophy and not on Scripture. And this is known as scholasticism. So Aristotle's philosophy became the underpinnings. Instead of the Bible, it was Greek philosophy that sat underneath the theological system of Europe. And the teaching methods of Plato, those are known as the didactic method, And the idea is teaching back and forth of students in a conversation. And oftentimes they would bring up two points and say, here are two different positions, let's argue about them, and then try to come to a synthesis of those. That's called dialectical teaching. And what they were doing there was trying to take Aristotle's philosophy and Christian scripture and put them together into a system. And that became scholastic theology. Now, this was so common that if you went to university to learn theology, you would expect, I would go to university, and the first thing they would teach me is how to read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, right? That's how we do it if we're going to send a man to seminary. But instead, they would actually simply give the theology of a man called Peter Lombard. He wrote a theological textbook called The Sentences, and they would give that to their students and say, study this. And essentially what that was just a simple commentary of the Bible, and not a very good one either for that matter, because it was all based on Aristotelian philosophy. So men weren't learning from Scripture. They were basically teaching philosophy with a Christian label on it. Men like Thomas Aquinas, you may have heard of, very well-known philosophers and theologians from the Middle Ages, but they were using a system that wasn't really based on Scripture. 
Now, about the time that Luther was born, there was a new movement and more study that was going on as a result of, instead of the 12th century Renaissance, the 15th century Renaissance, so 300 years later. And in this Renaissance, there became a lot more interest in primary sources, and that's what that Latin term ad fontes means, go back to the sources. And this was the rise of something that we call humanism. It's not the same sort of humanism we think about when we think about secular philosophy today. Humanism was simply using your mind and studying the original sources. And you may have heard of men like Erasmus of Rotterdam, who is known as the prince of the humanists, who took the Bible and put together a complete and accurate Greek manuscript. And that's actually the manuscript that Luther used to make his German translation of the Bible. Okay, so the rise of humanism was providing the church with an altogether new set of resources, primary languages, so that instead of having to read the Latin Vulgate version, which wasn't a great translation, Luther could go back and read in the original Hebrew, in the Greek, what the Bible really said. All right, so this is the change that was going on in Europe during this time, all influencing Luther. Now, one of the really important aspects of education in the Middle Ages was how university training went. And we have some ideas of what it should look like based on a schoolroom today, but schoolrooms in the Middle Ages were very, very different. Now, one of the primary tools that they used for teaching was something that looked a lot like a modern debate, and it was actually something called a disputation. And what a disputation was, was a three-phase public debate. So first, a university professor would sit down and do a lot of reading and research and look at it and say, hmm, there's something in here that doesn't make sense to me. And they'd put together a formal question, that's the second point, so first study, then formulate a question and put together a public debate. Now, when we think of a debate, we usually think of one person defending one idea and then the other person defending the opposite idea, but the disputes in the Middle Ages were basically one-sided affairs. A man would get up there and say, this is what I think is wrong, and here's my points to prove it. And those were called theses. All right? So you've heard of the 95 theses. Basically what they were were points of debate that Martin Luther was raising, and he was saying, here's 95 things that I have a problem with when it comes to this practice of indulgences. And John referred to that, the nailing of the 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg. That was one kind of invitation to disputation. But instead of focusing on that one, I want to focus on a different one tonight, and we'll get there in a moment. But you might ask, what's the point? Why would you do this? Well, there were really three purposes. So the interesting thing about a medieval classroom was that people didn't enroll ahead of time and say, I have John and Bob and Phil and Martin in my classroom, and they should show up and I'll take order. It was simply a professor got up there and taught, and his job was to get as many students in the door as he possibly could because they would come to the university to get educated, they'd spend their money in town, and it was a great economic source for the town. So essentially, the college would thrive if you had really great professors that could get people to come and listen to them. The more popular the professor, the better the university, the better the university, the more students would come. All right, so that was the idea behind this. Great disputations made for great student bodies. Now, from the point of view of students, they were learning how it was to perform as an academic. They were learning rhetoric, how to speak. They were learning logic. How do I think through a problem and formulate a discussion? So this was a form of education where they would be observing the professors doing a disputation. And then the third value in this was constant intellectual development. All right? If you're going to come up with a new idea, you need to be able to argue for it. And if someone disagrees, then they would have their disputation and tell you, no, you're wrong for these points. So there was a lot of this intellectual back and forth going around all throughout Europe and different European universities, including the universities in Germany that we're going to talk about. All right, so this is the educational system. Now, one last context piece that we need before we step into a little bit more about Martin Luther's preparation, and that's the fact that we typically think of the Reformation as this one-time event, and in a large way it was. There's something about the Great Reformation that's completely different than the Reformations that came before it. But the idea of reform in the church was not entirely new, and in fact, Luther was himself stepping into a reform movement that certainly must have influenced him. 
So one of the recurrent themes throughout the Roman Catholic Church through its history, and we're all well aware of this, was problems with those who were in charge, notably the priests, the clerics. And one of the problems, of course, was the fact that because church and state were so tightly interwoven, people who wanted power could go into the church to get it. And the church had authority over the state, and therefore, because they had that power, this was an office that was desired. Men were willing to pay a lot of money to get that office. And in fact, the whole business about indulgences in the 95 Theses basically came down to a man named Cardinal Albrecht. And what he was doing was essentially using indulgences to raise money for him to pay for the fact that he had two bishoprics and he was only supposed to ever have one. And the Pope was happy to look the other way as long as he could hand off some money to pay for it. So this dirty business was going on in the church all the time. In addition to that, of course, remember that the church uh, required celibacy of its officers, and that wasn't something they were particularly good at either. So between simony, the process of buying an office, and their sexual immorality, they were a real stain on Christian society. So when things got really bad, oftentimes a man would stand up and say, this is a problem, we have to fix the church. And the way that we're going to fix the church is we're going to reform it morally. We're going to get back to basics and we're going to start behaving ourselves. And oftentimes, this was driven by a large spiritual movement with a charismatic leader. And you probably recognize some of the names, right? All of these orders we talked about, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Benedictines, they, all, all, they were all started by a charismatic leader who was trying to lead a spiritual reform inside the church. The problem with all of these movements and what came out of them is that they worked for a little while, but they were only ever really moral reforms. They weren't getting to the root of the problem in theology, and that's the big difference with the Great Reformation is Martin Luther was able to see the problems in the church, the awful behavior of the popes that was going on in Rome, wasn't just because they were morally bad people, but because we just don't understand the theology behind this. And until we get to the bottom of it, we're never going to fix it. And that was the big insight that Martin Luther had. Now, as I had mentioned, at the time that Luther had become a monk, and we'll get to that in just a moment, when he became a monk, there was actually a reform movement going on in that Augustinian order that he joined. And that was because of a problem known as the schism, the great schism of the church, where there were multiple popes that had divided the church and then the great black plague that had killed off so many people in Europe, because of that, the church was kind of falling apart, including some of these religious orders. And as Europe was recovering from those great problems, what the reformers said was, we have to get the Augustinian order back to its old shape. We have to start following the rules. We're committed to the rule of St. Augustine. We have to actually follow that. And there were other men who kind of said, well, eh, not sure it's worth it. So they had divided, and there was a great split in which you had conventual men, and then you had men who were interested in reform. And these two separate movements within the Augustinian branch were causing a lot of upheaval, and that actually influenced Luther quite a bit, as we're going to find out. All right, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention it. Pope Gregory VII, I had him in there because he led what is known as the Gregorian reform of the church, and again, that was one of these big reform movements. All right, so that's context. Now, let's talk a little bit about how God was preparing Luther, especially for the work that he was going to do. So many of you know a lot of this history, so I'm going to be brief, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there are some details worth knowing. So first off, Luther initially was going to college in a town called Erfurt, which is kind of in, kind of in central Germany, as you can see on the map there. And what he was going there for was to become a lawyer. His father was a relatively wealthy business owner. He owned a, bin, a mining business. And Luther was being sent to become a lawyer where he could actually help the family business through his knowledge of law. And it was also a pretty lucrative career. So he was sent to Erfurt. And the University of Erfurt was a very prestigious college at that time in Europe. And he was sent there to get his degree. And he actually got his bachelor's degree and his master's degree in liberal arts. So very similar to what we would do going to college today. And the idea was, once he was done with that first few years of training, about four years, he would go on 
and do advanced training in law to actually become what's called a canon lawyer. And a canon lawyer is a man who specialized in the law of the church. So don't forget, church and society, hand in hand. So what governed society was the church's laws. And if you were a specialist in that, you were a lawyer. Now, as we all know, at some point, Luther, in his life, started to have doubts. And he told a story much later in life about this miraculous decision to go and become a priest. Uh, There's a lot of question as to whether it was really that abrupt of a change in his life. But regardless of that history, he suddenly, at the end of his master's degree, just before he went to school to become a lawyer, completely changed course against his parents' wish and decided to become a monk. So he went back to Erfurt. He joined the monastery of the Augustinians in town and started training to become a priest. And it took him about two years before he was ordained as a priest in the church. Now, remember I had said that the Augustinians were very, very involved in education. And Luther was a gifted man. And the head of his order said, Luther, you got to keep training. You need to get more education. We can use you in the university system in Europe. So they pushed him into more education. And for the next few years, he worked on getting another set of bachelor's degrees in theology. So went back to college effectively. Did that very quickly. It only took him a year. And then he got something that's known as a centenarius degree, which is essentially a master's of theology that allowed you to teach Peter Lombard sentences. Remember we said that was the textbook of the Middle Ages for theology. So he got those degrees and then went on to get his doctorate from the University of, or the Wittenberg University. Now, as we're going to talk about, This was kind of a podunk university at the time. Had just been started in 1502. Very, very new school. And the reason why Luther ended up there really had to do with that reform movement that I was talking about amongst the Augustinians. And he was at the monastery in Erfurt, and he had a disagreement, kind of a falling out with the other monks there. And many of those monks were actually instructors at the University of Erfurt. And they said, we're not interested in giving you your PhD. Get out of here. So he left and instead went to Wittenberg and got his Ph.D. at this school. And as soon as he got done with that, he moved on to his career as a professor in that school too. Now, a couple of interesting things that are very important influences in Luther's life here were two influences. The first of these was St. Augustine. And you say to yourself, well, of course, that makes sense. He's an Augustinian. But the thing is, is surprisingly, because of the corruption of the education system in Europe in those days, Even the Augustinians didn't study St. Augustine. But Luther did. And one of the fascinating things about it is, as he was carefully reading through all of Augustine's writing, he started realizing, this doesn't fit. What Augustine is saying does not match scholastic theology. It doesn't match what the church is teaching. And frankly, it matches the Bible a whole lot better. Because you see, Luther was an unusual student who really loved the primary languages and loved actually studying the Bible and took advantage of it. And he was one of the few people who could actually argue based on the Bible and say, Augustine was right, Peter Lombard was wrong. And one of the fascinating things too is very recently there was a library, an old library in Wittenberg, or rather in Erfurt, that was uh, basically all the books were taken off the shelf and cataloged And in that process, they found a bunch of books from Augustine. They opened it up, and lo and behold, Luther's notes were all written on the pages and the margins of that book. And they were absolutely confirmed based on the handwriting. This was Luther's handwriting. And all of the questions that he was asking, saying, this isn't right. We're saved by faith and by grace, not by works. All of those notes are sitting right there in those margins. So already as a student in college, he was starting to think, There's something really wrong here, and I want to get to the bottom of it. Now, one of the reasons he was able to get to the bottom of it eventually was the influence of another man known as Johann von Staupitz. And this man had two important positions that were really influential to Luther. First of all, he was known as the Vicar General of the Augustinians. You can sort of think of him as the president of the organization. So he was the one to whom all the Augustinian monasteries reported. Secondarily, von Staupitz was also the head of the theology department at the University of Wittenberg. And he was a well-known conservative in the church. He was actually brought there by Frederick the Wise because he appreciated him as a conservative in the church. 
One other thing about Van Staupitz is he was also the priest confessor for Luther, and Luther drove him nuts. Because Luther would literally get in there and confess and confess and confess, and he'd literally sit there for six hours confessing his sins. And Staupitz was saying, come on, buddy, i got things to do here. So he realized Luther was an unusual guy. But rather than pushing him to the sidelines because he was a bit annoying with his persistent confessions, he said, Let's encourage this guy. He's gifted. You should go get your doctorate. Luther said, "Ah, I'm not sure. Nope, you're going to get your doctorate. So Staupitz pushed him forward, and on top of that, he supported him all through the early parts of his career to get him in a position where he could start making a difference at the University of Wittenberg. So between Augustine and Staupitz, God had put influences in Luther's life that shaped him intellectually and also gave him the opportunities to be able to make a difference as he got into the church. So where did he start? Well, back to where he got his degree. So Staupitz at this time, as I had said, was the chairman of the theology department in Wittenberg, and he wanted out. He was a busy guy. He was doing way too much, and he said, I can't handle it all. I need someone talented who actually knows the Bible to take over my job. So he groomed Luther for that position, and as soon as Luther got his PhD, essentially, his doctorate, he stepped into the position of chair of the department. Had it been terrifying. So he is now in charge of all of the faculty of this department, and he was the professor of biblical studies. So that was his position, professor of biblical studies. Now, one of the first things that he did, completely with Staupitz's support, was to revise the curriculum. And he said, I can't stand Aristotle, I can't stand Peter Lombard, and I'm sick of reading their junk. We're done with it. We're actually going to study the Bible, guys because it's biblical studies. So that's what they did. They started studying the Bible. And instead of lecturing on Peter Lombard, he lectured on Scripture, starting with the Psalms, working his way through Romans and Galatians. And if you know the theology of Romans and Galatians, incredibly formative material in helping Luther to understand the doctrines of salvation by faith and grace alone. In addition to that, he was also pushed forward as a leader. So by the time we get to the story we're going to talk about with the Heidelberg Disputation, not only was he a professor, not only was he the chairman of the department, he was also the head of overseeing 12 different convents and monasteries in the region, and he was the guy who was the administrator for all of that. He was buried. But, by God's grace, he was able to maintain all that work and start asking questions. So this is really where those concerns came from. The first one I don't have to document too much. You're aware of them. That first concern was his own personal struggles. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard the stories of Luther's attempts to find grace in God's eyes by his works, by that practice of confessing for six hours to Staupitz, and penance and many other things. He lived a life of extreme poverty, constantly was starving himself, all trying to find grace in God's eyes. And he reached a breaking point where he simply said, I can't do it. No matter what I do, I am never going to be righteous in God's eyes. And that's when teaching in Romans, he understood what the righteousness of God meant was not my righteousness before God, but rather that the righteousness of God is Jesus Christ given to us. And in understanding that passage from Romans completely changed his perspective on what this theology meant. So that was one aspect. The other aspect that was important was again his frustration with scholastic theology and the fact that all people studied was non-biblical resources. How can you call yourself Christians if you don't even know what the Bible says? And he wasn't talking about the common everyday parishioner in the church, but even the professors in theological schools had no idea what the Bible said. He said, we gotta stop that. We have to get back to the beginning and know scripture. And also incredibly formative, was the fact, as I said, he was teaching from Romans, Galatians, and the Psalms. He spent four years lecturing through those books. He was incredibly popular as a teacher because he was saying things that people literally had never heard, simply exegeting God's word for them. Basically preaching in class to young men who wanted to become theologians. This was new. It was a completely different approach. And he had the support of Staupitz to do it. Now, The first thing that Luther did was to teach, and after several years, he finally said, now it's my turn. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to do a disputation. 
And the very first one that he actually posted was something known as the Disputation Against Scholastic Theology. So remember I had told you, he was sick and tired of this. He has lots of funny quotes about what he thinks of Aristotle. Some I'm capable of repeating here, others I can't. But he had a lot of harsh things to say about Aristotle. All right? He was going to get to the bottom of that, and in September of 1517, just before the 95 Theses, he had actually posted another set of theses, and they were to bring a disputation against scholastic theology. Then, just a month later, he posted another disputation because he was frustrated with the church's practice of indulgences. And this was at a particular poignant time in the history of the German church because a man named Johannes Tetzel, who was a priest, was going around preaching indulgences. And again, just a reminder, indulgences were this idea of, you give me some money, I'll give you a piece of paper that says you get out of purgatory for a little while. All right? So it was a great get-out-of-jail-free card for sin. But Tetzel had a great innovation. He said, not only do you have to pay me and get out of hell or get out of purgatory yourself, if your poor mom and dad are in there, if you pay me, I can get them out too. And of course, the Pope at the time said, hey, this is a great revenue source, right? You're not just paying for the living, now you can pay for the dead too. So because of this incredible greed of the Roman Catholic Church, this was allowed. And Martin Luther's initial premise was not necessarily to get rid of the entire Roman Catholic system of theology. He was simply saying, this practice is garbage. This guy is leeching money from people who can't afford it in Germany and taking advantage of us. This is baloney. He posted it, and ironically, that one in the middle, we're going to talk about a third one in a minute, is probably the least inflammatory of the three in terms of what he said and what he was trying to dig up and get rid of in the Roman Catholic Church. But because Tetzel couldn't keep his mouth shut, as soon as he saw it, he took off on it, and that's really what kicked off the Reformation. All right, so this disputation in the 95 Theses, remarkable, but not unique. This was a practice that was going on. Now, about a year after that, not even, less than six months after that, another very important disputation took place, and that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Because if you want an encapsulation of the early theology of Martin Luther, the Heidelberg Disputation allows you to see the wheels that were turning. And he was saying, there's a lot more going on here than indulgences, guys. There's a lot more than scholastic theology that's wrong here. There's all kinds of problems. And it starts from the very bottom with the doctrines of grace. And I want to show you how. So that's how the disputation, the Heidelberg Disputation, came to be. And that's where we're going to go next to talk about that. April 26, 1518. Now, just a bit about this. It was obviously, as the name implies, in the town of Heidelberg, which was a few hundred miles away from Wittenberg. He was asked to go there by von Staupitz specifically. This was not just for a disputation, but it was actually a regular meeting of the Augustinian order. All of the heads of the different monasteries would come together, and it would be presided over by von Staupitz, who was the Vicar General. Think of this as kind of like a classes meeting, all right? All of the different pastors, so to speak, representatives of the different convents and monasteries would come, and they would make decisions together, some having to do with just the mundane business of those orders, some theological issues, and just like happens at our different meetings of the church, theological issues would get hashed out. And at that meeting, von Staupitz really had two purposes. The first one is he was working so hard to bring those two factions of that split Augustinian order together. So that was one part of it. But the other part of it was the fact that Martin Luther was starting to become a well-known name in Germany and he was stirring up a lot of controversy. And Staupitz wanted to give him his day and say, you have a fair shot at explaining yourself. Why don't you do it here? But just give me a break and stay off the indulgences thing for a little while, would you? So that's basically what he told him. You can come here. Do a disputation on your theology, but just stay off of indulgences for a little while and tell us more about your thoughts on these other things. So Luther was allowed to come and do that, and he basically had a great opportunity here now to talk to all of the brethren in that Augustinian order and to explain to them what he had found in the writings of Augustine, what he had seen in Romans and Galatians and Psalms and throughout the rest of Scripture, and show them there's something fundamentally wrong here, guys. Wake up. And that's really what this was. This was a wake-up call to the theological community of Europe through the Augustinian order. 
Now, this ended up having a big impact on the Reformation, not just because of Luther's own life, but because of some of the attendees at this disputation. Especially there was a man there whose name was Martin Bucer. You may have heard of him. He became the great reformer of the city of Strasbourg in Germany, which became a center of the German Reformed, not the Lutheran, but the German Reformed Church. And that intermediate time in John Calvin's life, when he first got kicked out of Geneva, where did he go? He went to Strasbourg. And who was he mentored by? Martin Bucer. And where did Martin Bucer start finding out his theology? Right there. So this actually was the seedbed of Calvin's development theologically as well. Martin Bucer realized Luther's onto something here, and he himself became a great reformer in the German Reformed Church. Now, let's talk a little bit about the content of this before we drill down to this idea of a theology of the cross. So Luther had a specific purpose, and his specific purpose was this, to demonstrate through his academic style something about the contrast and paradox of Scripture. We read the passage that he based the entire disputation on to open up tonight. John read that, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 31. That's the passage where Paul lays out effectively the foundational theology that Luther was going to use for his disputation. And remember how in that passage Paul lays out these contrasts and paradoxes. The world's wisdom, God's wisdom, which looks like foolishness to the world. The world's strength, God's strength, which looks like weakness to the world. And Luther, if you read through the 28 theses of the Heidelberg Disputation, basically is using that same kind of contrast and paradox. And what he's trying to do through that is effectively to demonstrate through four sections that Luther, wa- or sorry, that Augustine was exactly right. And if you lay side by side Augustine's theology and Luther's theology, you see an incredible convergence of the two. It's not a coincidence. What Luther was trying to say is, guys, we are all Augustinian monks. We have this name on our religious order. At the very least, let's try to agree with what this man taught. And if you read the book by Marco Barone, fantastic book, it's very philosophical. Nonetheless, he does a wonderful job of breaking down this Heidelberg Disputation into four sections. The first three of these are going to be incredibly recognizable to you, and they're broken down. The numbers after that refer to which number of theses align with this subject. But if you look at those subjects, you're going to say, hey, I know this theology. This is what Luther wrote about later. Remember that book to Erasmus, The Bondage of the Will? Luther was already on to the freedom of the will and the problems with that issue already here in Heidelberg. What about man's works in the law of God? Can I be justified before God with works of the law? No, I can't. Justification is by faith, not works. It's already here, all right? And what is God's righteousness versus man's righteousness? How do we stand before a holy God and claim to be his children with the filthy rags of our works? the righteousness of God. All of these things are there this early in his career already. These had been festering, simmering in his mind, and he finally had an opportunity to put them out there. Now, the interesting thing that we're going to get into now in a little bit more detail was this last idea, which is contrasting two theologies. And the language of this isn't immediately obvious, because if I were to tell you I have a theology of glory, you'd probably nod your head and say, yeah, I have one too. I'm going to heaven like you are right? We all tend to think of that glory as a positive term. But Luther was looking at it from a different perspective, and he was saying, if all you ever think about is things that are glorious, and you bypass the cross, you have missed the core of Christian theology. We have to have a theology of the cross, not a theology of glory, and I'll explain that in a moment. All right, so this is the basic breakdown, and again, If you want a lot more excellent detail, read Marco's book. It's really good. All right, so what was Luther talking about? What is a theology of glory versus a theology of the cross? Here's the essential idea. The theology of glory takes a perspective only of God's glorious works in creation and history. It's not interested in the fall. It's not interested in suffering. It's not interested in the cross of Jesus Christ. 
It's interested in the glorious things that, have God, that God has done and nothing else. Whereas the theology of the cross takes the perspective as this. God's primary way that he's revealed himself to us is through the cross of Jesus Christ. That is foundational and fundamental to the Christian faith. And if you don't use that as your core perspective, you're going to miss everything. Now, the other aspect to the theology of the cross is its emphasis on power and authority. And again, think of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church didn't have a lot of interest in serving the poor and teaching people how to be servants, how suffering for Christ was necessary. What they were interested in was power, authority, and wealth. That was the Roman Catholic Church of his day. And Luther said, no, that's not right. The emphasis that we ought to have as members of the church and as Christians is on humility and suffering, not on power and authority. We're getting this backwards. And then finally, the kingdom theology was completely off kilter with this. The Roman Catholic Church saw the kingdom of God as a physical entity that had been manifested in the church. Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter, and it was on that rock, Peter, that Christ would build his church. End of story, here it was. The Roman Catholic Church was God's kingdom. Luther said, no, 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 that's not what Scripture teaches. This kingdom is a spiritual entity. And when it looks at glory, it's looking to heaven. It's not looking at this earth. It's not interested in accumulating wealth and power here and now. It's about Christ and his glory. So these two different theologies, when he talks about a theology of glory and a theology of the cross, these are the two different perspectives that Luther is comparing when he uses these terms. Now, the last thing I want to bring to you tonight is this. Luther's theology of the cross and how he articulated it is an unbelievable perspective for us today in the world that we live in. It gives us a point of view of church history from beginning to end. And it's also valuable in helping us understand how to address the culture in the world that we live in today. So I want to talk through this and tell you what I'm talking about when I think of the theology of cross as a fundamentally Christian worldview. So let's start out with where man naturally is. And what this is a picture of, by the way, is this is the inside of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This was the church that was being built by the money that Tetzel was selling his indulgences for. So half of it was to get good old Cardinal Albrecht, his office. The other half of the money was going to the Pope to fund building of this magnificent, glorious church. All right? All religion is fundamentally a theology of glory. Can you think of any religion, any, outside of Christianity as we understand it today, that says blessedness is in suffering? The way to live as a believer is to become a servant, not a lord. The goal is to give of myself rather than to take for myself. There is no religion that encapsulates that because religion, as a man-made construct, creates a theology that focuses on me, not on God. It's to get for me, not to give of myself. Religion, man-made religion, is a theology of glory. I want to point out something interesting here, too. Why don't I have you grab your Bibles and let's open up to the book of Matthew. Because I want to point out that this idea of a theology of glory lines up perfectly with how the disciples understood Jesus and what he had come to earth to do. And that's why I say the pre-Pentecost disciples. Until the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, the disciples flat out didn't get it. They sat with Jesus for three years At the end of three years, they were still asking the same questions. Lord, when is your kingdom coming? They wanted it here and now, all right? So let's start out specifically and take a look at Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10. So Matthew 4, 8 through 10. So in Matthew 4, 8 through 10, this is actually the temptations of Christ by the devil. And I want you to remember this because this is going to help lend some context to Jesus' rebuke to Peter in the next thing that we read, all right? So remember the three temptations that Jesus faced at the hands of the devil? This is the last one, verse 8. 
Again, the devil taketh him, Jesus, up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. What was the devil trying to sell Christ there? There's a way around the cross. You don't have to suffer to have glory. I already have all these kingdoms of the earth in the palm of my hand, and I'll give them to you if you just bow down to me. There's a way to avoid the cross. And Jesus' response, get thee hence. All right? First uh, evidence of this theology of glory. Let's turn now to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 21 through 25. All right. Now, the context here is Jesus is beginning to reveal to the disciples his ultimate plan and his death on the cross. And remember, the disciples have no idea what's coming. So verse 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. He was showing them the cross. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he, now Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. If you read that verse out of context, it sounds kind of harsh. Really? He said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan? But think back to what we just read. What was the temptation that Satan had brought to Jesus? Go around the cross. There's a way around. And what was Peter saying to him? Lord, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go to the cross. That's not going to happen to you. And that's why the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. Not pointed at Peter, because what Peter brought up was the exact same temptation that the devil had just brought to him earlier in his ministry. Okay, one last one. Let's read, uh, no, rather, Acts 1, verse 6. Acts 1, verse 6. So turn a couple chapters forward to the book of Acts. And now remember, Christ has died already at this point. He's been risen from the dead. He's ready to ascend into heaven. And now this is what he gets from his disciples. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And you just got to think, are you kidding me? He already died. He rose from the dead. He told you what he was going to do. And yet, what was the question? Are you going to restore your kingdom here? And it wasn't until after the, the ascension and the Holy Spirit had been poured out that the disciples finally got it. The cross isn't just an accessory to Christianity. The cross is the foundation of Christianity. There is no way around the cross for a Christian. And until they understood that, they would never understand what the kingdom of God really was. Now, we can go on and we can say something else here too because so many false doctrines that become common in the church also take on this same flavor of the glory of man and the glory of a kingdom here on earth. And for those of you who know the Protestant Reformed churches and know our roots in the controversy of 1924 and the issue of common grace, this may be familiar. But for visitors, just a brief introduction to that. The foundation of the denomination to which we belong really came through this discussion over what does God, what does God have planned in terms of salvation? And how does God look at those whom he's chosen to save versus those who he hasn't? And does God have a love for those who he has not chosen to save? And that doctrine is known as common grace. And there were three points associated with it. But let me read you something because this is kind of shocking. This comes out of the systematic theology of a man named Louis Burkhoff, who was a very well-known Dutch Reformed theologian at the time. And he was one of the main proponents of common grace. Listen to this. It, referring to common grace, curbs the destructive power of sin, maintains in a measure the moral order of the universe, thus making an orderly life possible distributes in varying degrees gifts and talents among men, 
promotes the development of science and art and showers untold blessings upon the children of men. I don't know about you, but that sounds just like a theology of glory. And I know Herman Huxema and Dan Hoff and Opoff, who were opposed to that theology, weren't opposed because they were thinking of Martin Luther, but that foundation and that premise is the same. Common grace is a theology of glory. It's about untold blessings on mankind here and now in this kingdom, in this world. And we've seen the fruits of that in churches that have grasped onto common grace and said, this is truth. It's a theology of glory. But lest we become too proud of ourselves, don't forget that we have a natural man in us too. Every one of us suffers from this exact same inclination. Every one of us, by nature, is always going to gravitate to a theology of glory at how we look at the world and even how we behave ourselves in the church. A theology of glory looks at what I can get and what I can do for me and isn't willing to serve, isn't willing to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And think about it even in terms of the church. Sad to say so often when we look at men who are qualified for the ministry or men who are qualified for office, what we think about is the man who's bold, the man who's outspoken, the man who's successfully run a business as an executive. The qualifications that we look at in office bearers oftentimes are not promoting a theology of the cross, the suffering servant, a man who's willing to quietly and humbly give himself without a big name and a reputation. That man gets bypassed, and we're willing to put into office someone who's just simply loud. I have to be careful. I'm not characterizing office bearers in general at all. But we ought to be careful because so easily what we gravitate to is the glorious, the shiny, the bright, the powerful, not the cross. We have to remember that. This is our natural inclination as well. Now, I also want to bring up something important here with regards to the society that we're living in today. And this is the one thesis theses from this specific uh, Heidelberg Disputation that I want to actually quote. So, Thesis 28. This was after Luther had gotten into introducing the idea of the theology of glory and the theology of the cross. But This is striking, and he's really reflecting here on Isaiah 5, verse 2 in this language. This is what he says. A theology of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theology of the cross calls the thing what it really is. And really what drew me into this entire discussion and interest in reading this was asking this question, what in the world is going on in our society today where we can go to a church and see a flag hanging outside that church with the rainbow colors obviously saying this church is supportive of the entire LGBTQ plus agenda? How is that possible? It seems beyond belief to us. And what really occurred to me is, isn't that exactly what Luther is describing? A theology of the glory calls evil good, sexual immorality good, and good evil. Anybody who would raise a voice to oppose that, you're a bigot. You're evil. It's completely inverted the scripture on its head, and yet it's posted on a church door saying, this is what it means to be a Christian. And this is where the modern church has gone. Why? It starts with the compromise of biblical authority. What happened in Luther's day? Not only was there a compromise of biblical authority, nobody even knew what the Bible said. But we're headed in that direction in the modern church culture. Do we know Scripture? Are we teaching Scripture? And do we base our teachings and our arguments on Scripture? Or is it about man's wisdom and man's arguments? Worldliness. When Scripture is compromised, what becomes the priority are the things of this world. And what flows out of that is complete apostasy in the church. We see that all around us. And Lord forbid that that should be true of the Protestant Reformed churches, that we would give up on the authority of the Scripture and allow worldliness and apostasy apostasy to influence how we think. And where that goes eventually is moral decay, to the point that the thought patterns in the church don't look any different than what's going on in the world. And we can put a rainbow flag outside a church and say, this is what Christianity looks like. Why? It's a theology of glory. This is simply a symptom of that. How do we know? How do you know 
when something at its root is a theology of glory, it calls evil good and good evil. It's written all over our nation today. What the theology of the cross, on the other hand, offers is a distinctively Christian worldview. It's a worldview that is paradoxical and a stumbling block to every kind of unbelief. And that gets back to what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 1, where he said, the gospel that I'm not ashamed to preach to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. What was he talking about? Well, again, when you look at the cross without eyes of faith, everything about it is misery. It's a death that was painful. It was the death of a slave. It was excruciating and it was intended to humiliate a person. Everything about the cross was accursed. The Jews looked at it and said, this is ridiculous, and went on with their moralistic uh, holiness. The Greeks looked at it and said, this is dumb. This is just foolish. And if you look at Aristotelian philosophy, the idea was personal enlightenment. If I can intellectually think through a problem, eventually I can expunge all the bad stuff that's part of me and get to a point where I can basically think myself into a state of perfection. That's Plato, that's Aristotle. To the Greeks, foolishness. To the Jews, a stumbling block. But to those who grasp it by faith, it's the power of God unto salvation. The other reason why I think this idea, and again, this is not from me, this is from Carl Truman, had a wonderful article uh, that he had published not long ago on the theology of the cross, and he really made a great point, is that the theology of cross acts as a sort of filter for our language and what we mean by vocabulary. Right? So just start, for instance, with the, world, with the word blessing. If you were to go out in the world right now and talk to somebody and say, I'm really blessed, they might get the clue that you're Christian, but they would be thinking in their mind, you have a wonderful family, your business is thriving, you're driving a nice car, it's just great living here in Southern California, isn't it? This is awesome. That's what they think with blessing. And what the cross does is it takes it and flips that. Because what did Christ say in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. That's what blessedness looks like when men persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. It takes the word blessing and completely, completely changes it. And we can do that with one word after another. What about power? Power to this world, we know exactly what that means. It's a man or a woman getting into office and being able to exert their will on the society around them. What's the power talk that Paul talks about? The power of God unto salvation. Jesus Christ giving his life on the cross, dying and living his life as a servant. Completely different kind of power. And you can go on and on and on with every theological term. Wisdom and foolishness. Weakness and strength. What is Paul bringing out? The cross completely changes everything. And without the eyes of faith, you will never see it because it simply is not a theology of glory. It's a theology of suffering. And it's a theology of difficulty. I also want to say this especially for young people. I know some of you are in college already, and I had the opportunity to teach in a college environment for a while, and thankfully it was a Christian college. But you're going to go into a world, whether it's a Christian college world or whether it's a secular environment, and you're going to hear one philosophy after another tossed at you. And what I would challenge you to do as you go out into the world, whether it's as a student or an employee, as you encounter these worldly philosophies, just ask yourself this. Is what I'm hearing a philosophy and a theology of glory? Or is this a philosophy and theology of the cross? It's a marvelous filter for whether you're hearing truth or a lie. Because if this philosophy that you hear or what you're being told tells you it's about your glory, your advancement, and about you, that's a theology of glory. Use this as a filter, young people, when you go out into the world because understanding what the theology of the cross is is going to give you great armament to be able to face those things when they come your way. Two last slides here and then I'm going to wrap up. Some disciplines of the cross. Matthew 16 says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, 
Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. I just put that diagram up there to remind you. The world that we're living in today is moving on that left-hand side. Abandoned, scorned, hated, persecuted. We don't like it. It's uncomfortable. We're used to living in that privilege zone where we're sort of in a Christian-ish nation. But if we have our expectations aligned with Scripture, the reality is taking up our cross is where Christ calls us to. The question is, how do we prepare for that? I want to bring up three different areas. Number one, church history. Just the work of putting together a speech on this, getting back into church history, has been incredibly profitable for me. But let me lend another suggestion for those of you who would like to read more or study more. Let's together as a body start reading early church history, first and second century church history. Those are the saints that lived at the top of that circle. They lived in a persecuted church, and yet they lived as vibrant believers in a society that was completely opposed to Christianity and was focused on the advancement of self. Think about the Roman pagan society they lived in. If we want to learn how to behave and live and interact with culture and to continue to shine our lights for Christ, we probably aren't going to learn best from 1920s America. We're going to learn best from looking at the church that's already been down this road and looking to them as an example and a witness of how we ought to let our light shine in the world that we live in today. Another discipline that I think I know that I can improve in, and probably all of us could say this, is in the area of apologetics. Apologetics is a branch of Christianity and a branch of theology that deals with defending the faith. This doesn't mean apology as in saying sorry for being Christian, but it means defending my faith. I think one of the reasons why we're not so great sometimes at this third point, evangelism, is because we never learn the second point. And it's scary to get out and go and evangelize if someone might answer or ask a question that I'm not prepared to deal with. And until we're confident talking to each other and defending the faith that's been delivered to us, until we're confident in that, it's going to be hard to thrive in evangelism. But the irony is, when the church has been most persecuted, has been when it's evangelism and its antithetical life has been the most effective in the world. This is an opportunity. Being in a world that hates Christianity, again, paradoxically, is the best opportunity we've had as believers to evangelize. Let's know our faith and be able to defend it first. And then this. Great quote from Carl Truman. The cross was not simply an atonement but a revelation of how God deals with those whom he loves. I want to end. Let's read the first portion of Hebrews 12 tonight. Hebrews 12. And this is encouragement from the author of Hebrews to Christians who are living in that persecution, who are living out their faiths, and said, this is hard. This is really hard. And this is what the author had to say to them. Remember, Hebrews 12 comes right after Hebrews 11. So the author just went through this whole list of the heroes of faith who suffered and bled and died for the name of Jesus Christ. And he says this, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, he's talking about all those heroes of faith, because we know them, because we know their stories, because we can read about them, because of that, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds." Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. 
If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Truman's saying the same thing, isn't he? The cross isn't just about the atonement, although that's fundamental. But it's also instructive to us of what we should expect. This is how God deals with those whom he loves. And if he can take the greatest evil of all time, the cross, and turn that into our salvation, how much more can he take any evil that we suffer and that we endure and not turn that into good for our sakes? Thank you for having me here tonight. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to your questions. Let's get our Psalters out. Again, if you have any questions, please write them on the cards, and um, we'll have a couple of our evangelism, evangelism Committee members walk around and gather those. And uh, we're going to sing Psalter number 265, all three verses. them all? All the questions? Anybody else have any questions to hand in? Brendan, do you need more time to look them over or do you want to come back up or should we sing? One more song. All right, we have Psalter number 201, 201, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, 6, and 7. 201, 1, 2, 6, and 7.
comment from me. When he's done with the question and answers, he'll close in prayer. And right when he's done closing in prayer, we may get up and exit the sanctuary. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for those who submitted questions. Um, some great material in here. I think the first one uh, is, is probably more of an, an, uh, an observation than a question, but I think this is uh, well said. Uh, the person who put this question in made an observation based on Scripture, ready always to give an answer of the hope that lies within me. Isn't it true that to be comfortable giving an answer to others, we first have to answer ourselves this question? And I think that's absolutely true. If we can't speak to the hope that's in us and our faith is sort of this abstract intellectual knowledge and not a heart knowledge of knowing where your hope lies, the ability to evangelize is always going to be severely compromised. So thank you for that question, but really observation. That's, that's well said. Uh, the next one uh, is a great historical question. Why did the 95 Theses cause such a big stir over the other Theses posted? Great question. So the answer really comes down to a couple of things. It really has to do with the politics of the church and the political situation in Germany at that time. Um, if someone got up and said, I disagree with scholastic theology, uh, most of the common people would kind of shrug their shoulders and go, yeah, okay, that's nice. They would have no idea what you're talking about. So it really didn't have a lot of political uh, implications at the time. But everybody knew about indulgences. Everybody knew about these preachers like Tetzel going from church to church saying, you can buy your way out of purgatory. And there were a lot of people in Germany who were very sensitive and angry about it, including people like Frederick the Wise and the other princes of the day. And they were looking at it and saying, that's our tax money that you're sending to Rome. You're taking the money away from our people and sending it all to Rome. It wasn't really a spiritual concern. It was very much a financial and a personal concern of the rulers. So there was a lot of tension between the Italians and the Germans. And because of that, because Luther's uh, theses on indulgences really stirred up that political hornet's nest. That really got a lot of traction. The other thing has a lot to do with the printing press too, right? So a few guys with the printing presses got a hold of this stuff and started making copies and they spread all over the place. And I think that's one of the main reasons, for instance, that Martin Luther's writings got so much further than John Huss, who was about a, a century earlier. There was no printing press at that time. So those ideas were much easier to suppress when you didn't have leaflets all over the place. So it, it had a lot to do with the, the political circumstances and the providential circumstances of those days. What are some good reasons to read about early church history? Well, I think the one that I had mentioned earlier especially relies on the fact that the world that we're living in today is starting to look a lot more like the pagan Roman and Greek culture that the apostles and then the early church lived in. In those days, given over to any kind of sexual uh, vice you can imagine, uh, every man for himself, secular philosophy, crime running rampant, all of these things where society was completely given over to its own pleasure. The church was living in those circumstances, and we live in those circumstances too, and let's not fool ourselves to think that we're not influenced by the philosophies and the world that we live in. We have such an incredibly affluent society that we live in. All of those influences that we face, that are pressures on us and our families, we're also there for that early church. I think that's a, a major reason why, is because those believers lived in the context that we're very much living in today. Um, should high schools have apologetics as a class? Sean, did you, did you answer this question? Okay, I thought that was coming from you. I thought right away, this sounds like a Sean question. All right, sorry to put you on the spot, Sean. I just thought as a teacher, you know. Um, so whoever asked the question, maybe it's the other Sean. I'll bet. All right, in any case, um, great question. I think the answer is yes. I think it would be wonderful if into our Bible classes we could start down that road, and I can actually tell you a man who's begun doing that. Uh, Mike Vanderveen in our, our Randolph Christian School has already started getting apologetics into his curriculum there with his uh, high school age kids. So uh, whoever asked the question, uh, if you're interested, Mike Vanderveen is a wonderful resource. So the answer is yes, and there's people already doing it. So great resource. Um, another one. 
how has the theology of the cross been manipulated today by one's power being given by how much they suffer? This factors into LGBTQ and the, the Black Lives Matter movement in uh, how, how today this theology is rampant today. I, I see where you're coming from. So very much the idea of critical theory and critical race theory that feeds the Black Lives Matter movement and also that feeds heavily into the LGBT and the ideas of intersectionality. It sounds like a theology of the cross, but it's not, all right? So yes, it's manipulating and leveraging the idea of victimhood and saying you have oppressors and the oppressed, and that's how we're going to divide society. The oppressed are morally good no matter what they do. The oppressors are morally bad no matter what they do. It's critical theory, right? So the idea behind that sounds like leveraging suffering, but remember, at the end of the day, the goal for those who are oppressed is not to say, I'm willing to suffer more and to be a servant. It's no, because it's my turn to be in power now. All right? So it's not about giving of self. It's about serving self by taking the identity of oppressed and victim and really leveraging this idea of a dialectical divide between the oppressed and the oppressor. So uh, I don't think it's a theology of the cross, but some of the language certainly may overlap. Would you say that the pre- and post-millennial views fall more closely in line with the theology of glory? Another great question, because how, do, how does the church go off track in the church world today? And certainly, eschatological views are going to have some pretty significant effects there. I would say this, pre-millennialists, yes, because the pre-millennial idea, right, is that the world is going to keep getting better and better and better, and there's going to be this thousand years after which Christ will return. So in that view, I think a theology of glory would be a big danger and an aspect of premillennial theology. Postmillennial, less so, because they expect the world to get really bad, Christ will come, and then make it better, right? So I think probably, if I, if I had to sort of align one of those, I would say the premillennial views of eschatology are more like a theology of glory. What would be good first and second century history to study? Who to read? What people to study? Wonderful questions. So, there's this magazine called Beacon Lights. And it turns out that this past year, Professor Doug Kuyper has been writing an entire series on early church fathers. And I think the first five of them, four or five of them, would be early first and second century. Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Polycarp, several men who would be wonderful people to read about and to think about because what they did was apologetics and defending the faith in the context of martyrhood. So there's a great place to start for young people. Pull out your beacon lights, look at January through probably May would be a great place. Um, secondarily, who to read more, people to study. There's some really great church historians that do great work with that. Carl Truman's one of them, but he does more medieval theology. Bob Godfrey, so Robert Godfrey, lives in Escondido, professor at Westminster Seminary, has a wonderful series of lectures on church history. I think it's like six, six parts, 10 lectures each or so. It'll take you a couple months to listen through them and you'll be very blessed by it. Wonderful set of lectures. He does a great job. The first segment is all about the early first and second century church. So if you want to learn more about what it was like in that part of church history, Robert Godfrey's history, brief history of the Christian church, wonderful uh, uh, opportunity. It's basically podcasts. They're about 25-ish minutes apiece. Download that from Ligonier. You can get it from Ligonier. Listen through that. It's wonderful. So there's a couple resources for you right there. And that's it. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here tonight. It's been a pleasure. I always love visiting, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak too. So why don't we close with prayer? Our gracious Father in heaven, we stand in awe before thee. Awe because... Anything that we could conceive of with our human minds, any plan that we would have had for salvation, any scheme that we could think of would never look like the plan that thou hast revealed unto us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we thank thee too for the gift of thy spirit, Lord, because even having the very fact of the cross revealed to us is not enough, but rather we need eyes of faith to look at that cross, to look at our suffering Savior, and to see him for what he is, our Lord and our Savior, the one of glory who took upon himself the flesh of man and suffered as a servant for our sakes. 
We pray then, Father, that that same spirit that gives us understanding and eyes of faith to see might be the same spirit that now empowers us to live lives knowing that the master is always greater and so the servant of the master will be treated just as that master. And just as our Lord was persecuted for his own righteousness, we take as a great honor, Father, to also face suffering because we have the name of Christ attached to us. Give us boldness, give us humility, and give us grace to live as believers in a world which less and less understands that and more and more looks to the glory of man. Thank thee too, Father, for the good examples that we were able to discuss tonight for Martin Luther and the history that is so important to us as believers. We pray, Lord, that having received this, that we might go forward in strength, knowing that we've been saved in Christ, who is our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption. Forgive us graciously of all said and done in sin tonight. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.